I'm Judge Young I Sims, Juvenile Court in Gwinnett County. And I'm Donald Lee, a guardian ad litem attorney. As members of CAPABA, we are excited to invite you to a special pro bono project supporting the work of Georgia Appleseed Center for Law and Justice. Georgia Appleseed advances justice and equity for all Georgia's children, with a particular focus on black and brown children and at-risk children. Georgia Appleseed works to dismantle the school-to-prison pipeline so that schools can provide children with needed supports and reduce their risk of involvement with the juvenile justice system. We all recognize the relationship between daily school attendance and school performance. The amount of time spent in class is a good measure of student access to education. Each tardy or absence means a student has lost an opportunity to learn. In order to address truancy and attendance, Georgia state law requires that communities and schools work together to address school climate and truancy through the recommendations of their local student attendance and school climate committees. Georgia Appleseed is developing resources to increase the engagement and success of student attendance and school climate committees statewide. This is where your pro bono support comes in. On October 23rd, 2021, Georgia Appleseed staff will lead a CLE training that will dive into the importance of the school climate, effective discipline strategies for keeping children in the class and out of the court system, and the role of the student attendance and school climate committees in those strategies. They will also train you in the pro bono project that you are committing to support. The CLE will be informative and interactive. The project asks for a three to four hour time commitment after the CLE training. In the week following the training, you will gather data on what different judicial jurisdictions across Georgia are doing to engage school climate attendance committees. By engaging with each jurisdiction, you will help Georgia Appleseed identify best practices for utilizing the committees to strengthen supports for schools and juvenile courts across Georgia. Gapaba is excited to support this initiative. We hope you will join us in supporting this important work of Georgia Appleseed. For more information about the CLE and Pro Bono Project, email Carolyn Durham, Legal and Policy Director for Georgia Appleseed. See, See you on, on October, October 23rd. 23rd. You know, she was, I nominated her for a student of the semester and she really blossomed after that. And the second experience I had was with a student, a male student who was on probation and he was my advocate in, in the classroom. So he would actually tell everyone, Ms. Hawk is talking, everyone be quiet. And I just remember just, you know, having this very personal experiences with these two students and, and seeing the potential in them and how important it is to have uh, mentors for these students. So that's my experience just, you know, as a former educator and I'm glad to be reconnected with um, students again in this capacity for this um, the CLE and hope to, um, to, to be able to reach out to students again in some way. Well, thank you so much. It's, it is easy to fall in love with the babies. That's I still call them the babies, no matter who they are. So I'm so glad you're here. Okay, Karen. Hey there, apologies for joining a few minutes late. I'm not sure what I missed on the first go round, but I'm in-house <laughs> counsel at Cox. I do litigation and employment law um, there, and um, I have a litigation background at Big Firm. So this just sounded like a great opportunity to do some really meaningful pro bono work. Um, of course, I have an affinity for work involving children and also the schools. So great opportunity to um, merge the two. All right, well, wonderful. Um, Sid, I think you might be our last but not least. <laughs> I am the least, but uh, uh, I, I um, you know, I just wanted to learn more about uh, this project and uh, try to think about ways in which it can be uh, replicated in other areas. Um, um, you know, you got a lot of educators here, and uh, one of the things I think that all of them probably have experienced um, is the highs, as Sarah was talking about, of uh, what happens when you change a life. And uh, I think that um, I was a trial lawyer for 40 years before I became a mediator. And I got to say that uh, even even now, uh, despite all the cases I've tried and, and, and the like, um, my greatest highs, I think, were while I was teaching. In, and I was teaching in a very... Um, low-income area and the purpose of my being there was to raise the reading levels. I was actually part of a federal project and um, that was my first teaching experience <clears throat> and I, I to this day can remember you know all the, this, these little things that made uh, remarkable differences just to get the kids to come to school 
and uh, it it uh, it was. Um, uh, and I think you, this project sounds like you can make a real big difference, and mm -hmm. I'd like to find ways in which I can support it and and promote it in some fashion because I think this is where I think uh, the prosecutors have talked about how the court system is very limited in what it can do, and um, that's what I find as a mediator is that mediation you can do all kinds of things, but in in the court system it's really up or down and how much and how long and that's it you know and and. Uh, uh, that's the opportunity of these kinds of projects. So I'm very excited to learn more. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. And so I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Michael, I'm going to try to share my screen really quickly. And it's fine if I go off because we're going to show a quick video. The school to prison pipeline is a phenomenon that no one likes to admit exists. It's hard to get your arms around this because there are so many dynamics associated with children from low socioeconomic status and poverty. Students start exhibiting behavior that puts them behind their peers. Once a child has been arrested as an adolescent or as a preteen, then you pretty much can almost guarantee that they're headed to prison. School systems around the nation developed a policy called zero tolerance, which means that there's no tolerance for any kind of misbehavior. So we're talking about fighting, uh, public disruption, uh, interfering with the operation of a school, misdemeanors that have led to a disproportionate number of students being sent to juvenile court. Think about it. If a child is not in school, what is that child doing? Many of them belong to single parent homes. Some of those parents are working two part-time jobs. They can't afford to be home with that child during the day. They can barely afford to make it to a parent-teacher conference. That's what suspension is. You do something wrong and then you're punished for it. We want to take what you do right and we want to encourage you to continue to do that. Just a little introduction into, and so what we wanted to do next, Michael, you can advance, um, was talk a little bit about your experience growing up so that we have a little context. So we used this, we, we thought that these were polar opposite examples. You have Ferris Bueller, you know, living the life, does whatever he wants to do, never gets it. Most, I'm assuming most folks have seen. Um, Ferris Bueller, um, but he, of course, you know, this teenager, you know, just, you know, come from a very, you know, affluent family, um, really, you know, got away with everything, you know, you know, did many, many things that in the real world would have at least raised some eyebrows, if not <laughs> caused him some really, some serious trouble. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, we have, um, did anybody watch The Wire? I'm not sure how many of you guys may have watched The Wire. Um, but we have a very young Michael B. Jordan um, playing, you know, portraying a young man living up, raised in Baltimore, live, you know, kind of working on the streets, not a lot of um, family support, you know, in the, the, the kind of drug game because of lack of opportunity and options. Um, and there's really this kind of dis disparity between, and that's not, you know, most of the kids that we're working with, but, but what we're, what we're trying to just kind of, we were trying to kind of show the disparity between when you look at a Ferris Bueller versus, um, oh, I'm going to call this young man Omar, that's not his character's name. I can't, I, don't, I can't remember if there's, is there anybody on here who watched The Wire with me? You know, it's um, this disparity between if you have these two young men in a school um, and how is the school going to treat them differently? How is based on, this could be based on where they attend school, where they live in the city, um, what their socioeconomic situation is. Um, but there's a big difference in how, in how our students, um, what their engagement with school looks like um, and how, what their experience is. And so we want to talk a little bit about our own experiences as teenage students 
my my experience was definitely a little more like Ferris Bueller's. I, I couldn't get away with anything, and I couldn't have taken the whole day to, to go around Chicago. Um, but my experience was definitely more like a Ferris Bueller's, um, and um, got away with a lot of things probably that that today wouldn't have happened. So we want to talk a little bit about. Um, kind of your teenage experience. So, Michael, I'll let you go because you're the only person I can see right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so what's, you know, what's beguiling about these two images, right, is, um, is you know, you've got this white kid, uh, affluent white kid on the left, and you've got, you've got this black, young black man on the right. And, um, and so it's easy to just say, oh, well, this is clearly a question of race and class um because those are obvious to us and at this moment in time we that's how we interpret a lot of social questions and those are really important but what karen was alluded to too because karen and i have similar stories um mm -hmm. but karen came from went to very urban public schools right and karen's a black woman i'm a white man that came from a very small very white town uh in mississippi um, and that was, had a, did, but was not affluent and we didn't have an, it was an affluent town. It was Mississippi, but, uh, so, but we still have very similar backgrounds. And so time plays a big role in how these stories play out. Um, Ferris Bueller, I can't remember when the movie was made, um, but 86 maybe. 80, so this is a time when we, we didn't anticipate that children who misbehaved at school and did outrageous things, including enormous crimes that he committed um, would necessarily, you know, be sent to prison for that. Um, that there was a lot of room for kids to, to make mistakes and that those we thought were dealt with severely at times, but dealt with in the school setting. Um, and so that's one of the, the reasons I love, I didn't make the slide actually carrying and, um, and her team came with the slide. And I think it's actually, there's a, there's a lot of subtlety to it. So my experience was, was not rural, but small town, Mississippi, there was no anticipation that there would be a violence in school other than fighting. Uh, and then there was very little an anticipation that any of us would have um, cri like a criminal record or there would be a, we'd be referred to juvenile court uh, or suspended or expelled except for pretty, pretty serious behaviors. Uh, and so today that's very different. We're gonna talk about the history in just a second. But we thought we'd go around and let folks share if they had any experiences, they wanted to share that were a little different. So, and I think a threshold question for me, and Karen, you can tell me it might be different for you. And, and mm -hmm. if y'all raise what y'all find interesting about this as well, of course, but just to kind of kick us off, a threshold question for me is, um, you know, when you were in school, wh what was that climate like? Was it a school climate? And we haven't talked about that term yet, but at George Appleseed, we use that term a lot. So was the school climate there one of where there was an anticipation that, um, people who got in trouble or broke school rules um, would have, would, that there would be a juvenile justice component to that, that there was a risk there of that. Uh, was there an anticipation that there might be violence at the school and that you needed to prepare this, protect students and faculty and staff from violence? So those are some questions to kind of kick things off. I will say from my own experience, you know, there was really very little real anticipation that there would be violence at the school that we needed to be protected from. Um, and also uh, very, very, for mo the vast majority of us, we, we never were concerned about being referred to juvenile court. I mean, there were students where that did happen, but it was very rare uh, and it was just wasn't part of the normal kind of dialogue among the student or concern. So I'll start. And then it, if you just would like to volunteer, um, we'll take that space. Um, I'll go ahead and just kind of give my background. So I, I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas, which was, um, did not have a large Hispanic population. <laughs> so, um, but I did, I was lucky enough to go to Catholic schools. Um, my mom was an educator. And so, um, we got involved in the Catholic school program. They had gone to Catholic schools in Guatemala, but I did have experience, um, exposure to other countries because we would go back to Guatemala and I kind of saw what things were like there. Um, but for me, there definitely wasn't, I went to school in the eighties, um, cause I'm older and, um, it, there was definitely not that sense of violence happening in the schools. Even my friends who went to public schools, there would be those few people that you would hear about like, oh, they're the troublemakers. Um, they're the ones who, you know, are getting suspended or expelled. But it, it definitely was different than when I did my 12 years of teaching. 
um, in the early 2000s, I saw a definite switch from that perspective. Um, it didn't, there didn't seem to be that sense either of like so much of the juvenile system of crime and juveniles committing crimes, um, at least from my perception. Um, I'll go. So I grew up in uh, Kennesaw, Georgia, which is a suburb um, about an hour north of Atlanta. And um, I also grew up in the 80s and uh, did not really see uh, the issues of, um, of uh, juvenile court with my classmates. Um, but as a teacher, I definitely, especially um, working in a, an area that was transitional, a lot of um, single parent households, um, uh, students who, you know, often uh, were, you know, moving to different apartments. I did see more of the juvenile court system in, in place um, as a teacher, and um, especially the reference to zero tolerance, um, you know, that has really impacted a lot of students. Uh, uh, so I, I have seen the, the, the change over the course of, um, from being a student uh, 20 years ago, and then, you know, as a teacher for, for the four years that I was a teacher. Right, and I'll, I'll just jump in. I actually grew up right here in Atlanta, in Southwest Atlanta. Um, and I went to an all black L, uh, middle school and an all black high school. And similarly to, to Michael and say, I grew up in the, in the 80s, finished in the early 90s. Um, and there was, you know, if, a, if there was no anticipation of violence in the school, there was, I mean, you have your typical school fights, those kinds of things, um, but there was never any concern. Um, I don't think I had any idea where the juvenile court was. I'd, I'd never seen, we, we never, I mean, there were never officers in the school. There was never anybody charged in juvenile court for anything. Um, and so the 30 years later, um, from, you know, my grad, it's a very different city. It's a very different it's school environment. It's a very different expectation of, of what happens in school for what I think a lot of us consider to be typical teenage behavior. You know, that kind of leads us to, as, you know, Sarah mentioned, this idea of um, this kind of zero tolerance and how we got there. Um, it really kind of started in the early 90s. And Michael, please jump in here because I know you know this. We're, we're going to tag team on this a little bit. But you had this idea, um, you know, of the, the super predator was born. And so the super predator was kind of born out of, um, you know, the, the, the 90s, you know, the early 90s were a little violent. There were, um, there were definitely some incidents that were happening. But the response and reaction for a lot of us was, was a little, was too far. Because what we came up, there was an article written about this, um, this super predator, and the super predator was basically I, a young black male, and they, you know, who was kind of out of control, and we needed to put some, as a country, we needed to put some parameters in place um, to kind of stem this, the, the growth of this super predator and, and kind of taking over the world. And so what resulted from that was this idea that we needed to start putting some more serious rules and regulations and legislation in place um, when it comes when it came to how do we charge youth do we, we start charging youth um, as adults for for certain crimes instead of uh, letting them stay in juvenile court we're going to start sending them to superior court with Liz and so on top of that you had Columbine um, in 99 98 99 99 and, and which at the same time so you've got all this stuff going on in the criminal justice system with the super predator and how do we protect everyday citizens from the super predator who's coming to get all of us with now this concern about violence actually within the schools and this fear of, of you know, we got to start policing our schools um, in a way to keep everyone safe. And so between those two um, kind of uh, incidents, movements, you, you looked up and you had zero tolerance in the schools, which basically school systems all over the country adapted um, these very strict rules, policies around how we are going to deal with infractions that in our day, well, in my day, I'll say that, would have been detention, suspension, um, and zero tolerance was put in place. And now typical teenage behavior 
in so many instances was being treated as a crime. And you started seeing school resource officers, otherwise known as police officers in the schools, and you started seeing a, a, a number of charges coming out of the schools and going to juvenile court. Um, and so that is really how the school to prison pipeline began. Um, it really began with this lack of um, of creating, really creating a school climate that is was not conducive to the way that we really grow up as teenagers, how our, how we develop, how adolescents really develop. It was not very tolerant of that. And so over the years, we have seen more and more schools. Um, you know, school systems now have their own police departments. Like internally, it's not even, you know, Atlanta public, I mean, Atlanta police department coming in and borrowing, you know, the school system borrowing officers. School systems have their own internal police departments, full, full, fully trained, um, fully equipped to, to you know, to, to, enough to have two, three officers in every school within the system. Um, and so what we have, what has also happened, you got to think about it, you've got police officers in the school. You don't have, you've got, you don't have police officers who are trained, generally speaking, as social workers or counselors. You have law enforcement in the schools. And so um, law enforcement is used to dealing with, with problems um, as, as if people are committing criminal acts and um, putting the safety of others in question. And so that is why we've all seen videos of students in classrooms being drug down the halls or pulled out of chairs and those kinds of things. And so that's, that's really how school climate has evolved. And so um, when you think about who within the school systems, who are really the targets, and target's not a good word, but who really are, are, are the, the main um, um, contingents of students who feel the brunt of of uh, school policing and zero tolerance. We can go to the next slide. Um, hey, Karen, Karen, do you mind if I, before we do that? Oh, sure. I, uh, so, so, you know, as I, as I listen to Karen, and um, what's, uh, there's a couple things that always sort of fascinate me about this conversation and, the, and this particular issue and what's different from a lot of other issues. So if you take, if you take sort of, um, you take racial discrimination in the United States and structural racism in the United States, we're typically thinking about a progressive historical kind of view, right? We, we like things are worse in the past. They're not getting better fast enough. And we often tend to think of it in terms of the national mindset as like progress towards like there's a future is getting brighter. That's what we hope. And, 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 and that's sort of like a, there's a vision around that. What's interesting about this particular moment in education is there are a lot of us who can remember being in schools where there were no police. And so what you've got is a progression in a totally different direction. Uh, and that to me is actually kind of a liberating thought. Now, it's interesting if there are folks on the phone call who are born, who were, who were um, in school in the late 90s, early 2000s, you may be like, this is just our reality. And it always has been. Like, we, you, know, you don't remember that moment. And so that's not a liberating thought. But it is something to sort of talk to people about and ask them what was going on in their schools and how their schools responded to, um, to, to discipline issues and, and the difference between discipline and crime. Like, you know, that uh, breaking the school rules, engaging in behavior at a school, even behaving, getting in fights and those kinds of things, how they were handled before and whether they were considered crimes or not. Um, the other thing about this uh, in terms of the social context uh, which may be every obvious to everyone, but just a sort of reminder, as Karen said, you know there was a there's a there's sort of as the the nations felt about criminal justice and as it was sort of trying out new theories around criminal justice, that in the criminal justice system, that same those same conversations were having in the were ha were happening in the school system, right? So the the school was all the schools were also trying out these similar theories. So when you had like you know, windows, uh, I can't remember how it's called, broken windows policing, right? So that's, those same sort of theories were being applied in the school setting, which actually is a natural fit because the school setting um, is, a, is what we call a carceral setting, right? Um, it is a setting in which the children can't leave, right? You don't have the choice to just leave. And so when you have an environment like that, where the, the, the people that are in the space don't have choices about where they go and how they spend their time, it creates additional kind of pressures um, it creates additional stresses 
that, and you have to you have to make choices about how you manage those, right? And so, that as the school systems and the, as the criminal justice system was trying out new theories, the schools were trying out similar theories. So, putting this in, in historical context is really important because you're going to see as this zero tolerance um, policies grab the nation as a solution, you see a real and how those were used and how they're incorporated into school discipline policies, like written down, codified in schools. Um, and then you see, as we start to enter into a criminal justice reform space, so just take the Georgia example, right, when Nathan Deal was governor and there was a lot of energy around that, then the schools and Georgia Appleseed along with them really start tackling this issue because and start finding solutions to the the student the school to prison pipeline problem. So effectively, the school system being turned into the third criminal justice system in the state, where it's where it's funneling more and more and more and more and more kids into the juvenile court directly or indirectly through suspensions and expulsions. So you see, uh, if you were to go to our website, and uh, if you go to our website, you'll see, you know, a, a, a graph. You can see since 2011 how our suspension rate in the state has gone. And it has dropped precipitously since that high point. And that is not because of, um, it's not because of social phenomenon that are sort of inchoate and hard for us to understand and high theory. It's because of very explicit strategies and tactics adopted by the state, schools, and nonprofits like Georgia Appleseed and others around school climate and reforming school discipline. And you'll see that precipitous drop. Um, and that, that drop has benefited some populations more than others. And it's really important to note the, the racial justice um, part of this. And I, that's my setup, Karen, for your next slide. Thank you. All right, so most vulnerable students who are the most likely to receive harsh dis exclusionary discipline. Students with disabilities. Um, and so we're talking about students who have behavioral or learning disabilities, students um, who are in our, our you know, experiencing poverty, students of color, generally going to be black and brown students, um, children in foster care, children who are ex experiencing homelessness, and our LGBTQIA plus students. Um, these are literally the students that, as you look at, and we're going to, we've got some, um, some data following, following this slide. When you look at um, exclusionary discipline in a harsher, disciplinary measures that are taken in schools, really across the country. This, you're, you're, you'll see a smattering, surely, of a few other kids, but this is, they, these are the, um, the groups of students that you are going to primarily see over and over and over again. So in our metro area, which, you know, generally for most of us, that's gonna be Cobb, Clayton, DeKalb, Fulton, Gwinnett counties. We're gonna show you kind of the percentages of students um, who get free and reduced lunch, which is going to, that's usually our, our students who um, are living kind of at or below the poverty line. And you compare that to the graph of students who are in OSS, which is out of school suspension. You can see how they match up. You can really kind of see how those, those percentages are, are very closely aligned um, and and you can really see that connection there um, because again when we're talking about our children who are generally the most affected we're talking about our kids who are at or below the poverty line we're going to focus on economic status and this one here just really kind of looks at our economically disadvantaged students up against the percentage, so we've only got 44.5% of, um, in Georgia's public schools, economically disadvantaged students, but those students are 55.9% of the, of, the, of the students who receive the harsher discipline versus our non-economically disadvantaged, as you see, it's the complete opposite, it's a flip. They are the lower percentage of students who receive the harsher exclusionary discipline. And so you can see there the disparity there um, even though economically disadvantaged students are in the minority, they receive the majority of harsher disciplinary measures in school. We can go to the next one, Michael. Overall, again, you can see here along racial lines that even though black students are in the minority, 36.9% here in, in Georgia public schools, 
they received 55.9% of the harsher disciplinary measures. Same with our Hispanic population. Um, they are, well, they're a little bit, it's, 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 you can see actually kind of the disparity there that even though um, white students are 37.8% um, of the population, they're only re we're only seeing 26% of those students receiving harsh discipline. Discipline. So you'll see here in terms of Hispanic students, 16.7% of the population and receiving 12.5% of the discipline. Um, so you can see that our, our, when we look at harsh disciplinary measures in our schools, and this does not matter, you know, practice, you know Michael and I have spent a lot of time, a lot of time in our public schools here um, in the metro area. And, and honestly, it doesn't matter um, who is 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 in the, in the administration at the school? If it's if it's a school that has primarily African American um, administration or a primarily white administration, um, you still see the same types of disparities when it comes to school discipline. Um, so it's kind of across the board. Go ahead, Michael. You sure. Start. I you know a couple of things to note about this that I that I think are really important. One is to point out, and I had a call with a funder the other day, and they were they they tend to think about minority students and how, you know, my store, minority students are, are being treated versus the majority. And I'd like to point out in Georgia, um, non-white students are the majority in Georgia. And so it's, in, I think that's an important thing to consider that, you know, we're not, we're talking about privileging a minority at this point. Um, and that's just, that's just something to sort of think about. Uh, the second thing is when you look at, we're going to talk in a second about strategies and how how you address these disparities um, and and why these disparities are happening the research when you look at the research and it's unfortunately very difficult to get good solid data in george on a lot of this because the state doesn't collect it but when you look at the research nationwide um, what you find is that white kids are more likely to be punished for things that are like concrete provable kind of offenses so you know like the kid brought a gun to school the kid brought drugs to school. The kid stole something. Something you know that's provable in the sense that we would think of it as lawyers. Like there's a there's a sort of you know there's a there's a standard of proof and there's evidence that fact based evidence that we could use to bring in hard evidence. Um, black kids are much more likely to be punished for disrespectful behavior. Right. Right. And these are so these are you know where there's a lot of interpretation and there's potential for cultural conflict here between teachers and staff. Um, and as Karen pointed out, it, it it it's not the cultural difference is not necessarily white versus black. It's an institutional cultural expectation that may not meet with this you know with where the students are coming from or recognizing some of the challenges the students come to school with. Uh, and so this this plays out. In fact. Um, some of our districts that have the highest rates of OSS are districts that are black, black led um, districts with black students. Yeah. And so um, we don't have a slide here. The slide before shows economic status uh, and that plays a huge role. So for some of these kids where you have and in a lot of our particular our black children in the state. You know, you, you have that intersection of poverty and race and those kids just step into the school um, with with it just stacked against them and and the story that karen and i will kind of talk about is you know it's just so sad as a child wakes up in the morning optimistic because they're a kid and they're optimistic and they're going to be the best kid that day they're probably going to learn how to fly you know and be a superhero but on top of that they're going to be a good kid that day they're going to wake up and they're going to please their teachers and their parents their caregivers um and and then the harsh reality starts to step in as they sort of move towards the move through the morning uh and so Usually it's some adult and something an adult has done gets in their way. And by the time they get to school, it's just almost a foregone, con foregone conclusion that they're going to get in some kind of conflict with the school or a teacher. Um, and so, you know, that's a tragic story in part because it starts with such optimism. You know, the child wants to do well. But you can see from these statistics and when you compare them to the actual rates and we haven't we haven't done that yet. What is what is the rate of suspension? in Georgia. So that's actually a great question. So here's, why don't we do that, Karen? I don't think it's on a slide here, but why don't we ask her, what do you think is the OSS rate or the, the, the out of school suspension rate in the state of Georgia? In other words, what percentage of students are expelled for 10 days or more every year during the school year? Do you want to throw out a number? So this is a total like number of kids every year in Georgia. 
Just a guess. No wrong answers. I mean, actually, absolutely. Yeah. Throw right. something out there. <laughs> you can put it in the chat or whatever. Let's see. Is anybody, anybody brave enough to do it? Carrie, can, can you look on your computer and make sure I don't mess this up? Um, about, so just go okay. to our website. How about 10%? 10 days or more? Okay. 10 days or more. Is that what you said? All right, maybe 10, 15%. Okay. All right, well, let's just, let's just do... Actually, let's just do out of school suspension in general. So not necessarily 10 days or more. Oh. Just how many kids are being kicked out of school every year? Then I'd say 20%. 20%. Okay. And Karen, since I am sharing screen and I've got both screens lined up, can you, um, let's get the exact numbers. So this, this is a good opportunity for me to tell everybody where to get the exact numbers. So okay. there, are two, there are two places in the state um, to go. And if you want to check this out, and I encourage everyone to do this. So the first is our website. So you can go to our website, gaappleseed.org, and there's a banner right in the middle that says Keeping Kids in Class Toolkit. Just hit that. It will take you to a chart that will show you um, how you know, the, state, the state OSS rate and how it's uh, been going across the last 10 years or so. And you can compare with, um, with, other, with the state app. You can go to an individual school and break down by race and gender and economic um, status, and then you can compare with the state average. You can also go to the government's Office of Student Achievement, so um, Governor's Office of Student Achievement, GOSA, and they have a chart there too. They, they provide more breakdowns, more information, but it's a little more complicated interface and you don't, you don't get to compare with the state average as you're looking at your school. So um, what, what, what's, what are we reporting, Karen, from la the year before last? Because last year was a weird year. If you look at overall, the number this year is not 20%, thank goodness, which is maybe, right. but it actually some school 20%. districts do kind of approach that. The number, the number is 6.2%, which is a drop um, from 7.7% in 2011. But there's 1.8 million kids. So you're talking about 112,000 children. Mm-hmm. 112,000 children. And the minute you suspend those kids, there's put out their, their risk of juvenile justice and criminal justice involvement goes way up, not to mention uh, yeah. learning loss. And so there's tremendous risk here uh, for these kids. And that's a lot of kids. If you, if you think about this from a public health perspective, you're, you're talking about inflicting that risk on well over 100,000 young people and every, every single year, just in our state alone. Um, now we'll talk in a second about interventions, and we we do need to. We'll talk about the one that we're actually here to discuss in particular. But mm -hmm. that is, you know, the interventions work. They matter. There, you know, in 2011 there was only 1.7 million kids in the school system, and we had 135,000 kids that year suspended out of school. So these interventions over the last few years have gotten us down to only 112,000 kids, even though the population has gone up. So they're significant, they matter, they work. The challenge that we're all facing right now is, um, is that, as I mentioned earlier, you know, with mo social movements, there is, there is less energy now politically to support these kind of interventions. Especially in this moment where there's a, you know, crime is on the rise in cities, violent, I should say, violent crime is on the rise in cities, particularly among adults. Mm -hmm. And so now there's less interest in pursuing these. We're at a critical moment where we, we could, again, decide as a nation that we're just going to sacrifice the lives of some of these kids um, because, you know, we're concerned about this other, this other issue, this other social good, um, which is to have less violent crimes in cities. But we need to be really, really cautious about that and not lose... Um, the momentum on what has been a, a slow but significant success story. And I will say before we move on, when you look at the breakdown, and I encourage everyone again to go to our website and do this, when you look at the breakdown over the last um, 10 years and you, uh, for the state, so you go from a 7.7% down to 6.25, 5% last year, but last year was a strange year because there was out of school. Uh, and then you break it down by race. The, the group that saw the biggest decline were black students. And these, by the way, are driven by black boys who are at the highest risk mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. all kinds of reasons. Um, so this decline went from 13% for them down to 8%. Um, and so that's a huge drop. And, and a lot of that has to do with not because the kids are changing. These interventions that we're going to talk to you about are not about 
learn like children stopping not being children anymore or that we've solved the poverty problem in Georgia. <laughs> These interventions that we're going to talk about are actually changing the behaviors of the adults in the room, not the kids. So, um, you know, okay, let's move on to the next slide. I'll so, we, and I know we've only got about 24 more minutes, and we want to make sure we get you guys out of here on time. So, you know, as Michael really said, um, when we talk about consequences of the school to prison pipeline, and we were talking about kids who are literally being excluded, suspended, in school suspension, out of school suspension, um, being expelled from school for periods of time. And so, what all of those things, when you have these harsh um, disciplinary measures that, that take kids out of school, disengage them from school, you look up and you have children who are dropping out, who have more time and opportunity to engage with the, with the juvenile justice system um, and, and, and really kind of move into, move away from the school environment into the criminal justice system. And so Georgia, um, has really, you know, really in the in the early 2000s, um, started looking at um, juvenile justice reform, and really said, you know, as a state, we our, our our juvenile code has not been revised, hasn't been touched since the early 70s. I think it was like 73 or 74 when I was born. I'm like, whoop, that's a long time. So hadn't even been revised, edited um, in in a, in a major way, and so. Um, Georgia Appleseed um, was very instrumental in really getting the movement started to say, as a state, we need to, to start looking at our juvenile code and how we are treating our, our youth, start looking at how some of these reforms at the juvenile justice level can also inform some of our bigger criminal justice reform. And at the same time, you started to have a lot of reform at the, at the school level. And, and, and people, you know, and our legislators really starting to take time to look at how school attendance, truancy, school dropout, and school climate were impacting um, our children's ability to, to be successful. And so Georgia basically said, as it, came, as it relates to, to school climate and education reform, the first thing that, that happened back in, I think, 2005 was let's look at, at school attendance and how do we do a better job of keeping our kids in school. Here in Georgia, kids can drop out at 16, which is still an issue. We're, we're still working on that. Um, but when we have kids, how do we, cont how do we continue to engage them and keep them engaged in a way that, that, that we won't continue to see these dropout rates that we have? And so the school, the school attendance committees, that's kind of how they were born. And the school attendance committees are basically each superior court judge um, in the state. And we have 159 counties, not quite 159 judicial circuits, but um, each superior court judge is supposed to, is charged with um, form you, forming a really a, this kind of large um, interagency team with the schools, um, the school systems, the, the courts, um, law enforcement, um, partners, community partners, to look at um, how we are engaging with our students, how we're treating our students when it comes to attendance, how we are um, handling a lack of attendance at the school level, at the court level, and in the community, and really charge these, these, these committees with coming together to create some protocols around um, that that treatment, that engagement with students, and really trying to get them back into the classroom and re-engage them in school and prevent kids from dropping out. And can I can I As, interject something yeah. here, Karen? So, Karen has a lot of very personal experience with these types of committees. There's um, so we we kind of loosely call them school justice partnerships, um, and uh, and sometimes it's the this the juvenile court, this superior court will ask the juvenile court effectively to handle this. Um, it's also nestled into, just wanted to bring it right back to the beginning, Karen, you know, mm -hmm. nestled into it's um, the strategy of community level engagement over schools. So it's one of several strategies that the state adopted and, um, and that George Appleseed played a large role in, along with a lot of other partners like Voices for Georgia's Children, um, Department of Education, you know, individual school systems stood out. And, <clears throat> and those were everything from 
rewriting discipline codes to, to look at institutional bias and racism and how they were playing out in those codes. So famously, we often hear about like, you know, codes about what you wear or your hair and how those are affected by you know, racial bias, even when, even when not intentional, like those are significant racial <laughs> bias, because those do in fact lead to severe discipline consequences for kids. And they are based on, on factors that just don't matter that much um, in terms mm -hmm. of the school setting. So that also um, looking at school climate deeply. So PBIS is the school climate program that is most um, adopted in Georgia. And we've worked really hard to get about 50% or more of the schools to adopt those. And the evidence shows that when schools adopt it, particularly with high fidelity, you have lower discipline problems all around, higher teacher attendance um, and higher teacher retention as well. So there were a number of efforts, as Karen pointed out, that work together at the individual school level and on the state policy level. And where this particular intervention fits is right there in the middle. And it's getting the local stakeholders to come together and talk about implementing strategies, again, mostly affecting how the adults in the room act and interact with kids um, in order to reduce that flow of kids from the schools to the courts and to increase school climate overall to increase educational um, performance. So I'm going to, Karen, sorry, I'll, I will add, I'll color commentate as we go on, but. Um, right. No, I love, he always like, he fills in, he fills in the, the, the gray areas for me. Um, so, so we have now in Georgia, these, these committees, as Michael said, and, and, and they have really, um, in, in some communities such as Fulton have formed these school justice partnerships. Um, where it's a beautiful collaboration. Um, and so what we, what this project is, is really all about is, um, you know, we've got this legislation in place. We know that some counties across the state um, are doing a wonderful job of convening, really planning, working together, implementing some policies and, and processes at the school level, some, some interventions. But we don't have a good idea of how many of our communities across the state and courts across the state are doing this work and are, are really able to implement um, these committees the way that they were intended. And so that's really where all of you come in. We are, are, are really trying to, this project is really all about having you as our volunteers reaching out to the chief judge or the chambers of the superior courts. Um, and we're, we are going to give you guys, we're gonna assign you a, a number of, of counties. So again, Georgia has a lot of counties, 159. What we're going to ask you to do is, and you know, we will give, there's a, there's a, a survey link that we will send to all of you um, that will lead to the questions. So the questions are already in the survey. There's a little script that, we'll, that we will provide you that, that really just kind of, you know, walks you through kind of the introduction, a little discussion about Georgia Appleseed and the, and the project itself and, and the information that we are trying to glean from them. Um, but but the, the, the goal of the project is, one, of course, to find out, do superior courts have these committees or have they turned it over to the juvenile court to, to have these committees and are they convening? Um, but we really are, are a big part of this project for us um, it, because what we're anticipating is that there are not going to be a lot of counties that are doing that are that are actually meeting um, and have formed these committees, or if they had it at one point, they're not necessarily convening now. And so, a big part of this project for us um, is really finding out who's doing it, who's not, so that as we continue to move forward, we can work um, with our legislators and with our community partners and 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 around the state and locally to find out, to, to figure out how do we go about really encouraging um, the implementation, the proper implementation of, of, of these committees and making sure that they are operating as they are, in, as, they are as intended. Um, and so what, um, what we are gonna be doing is, you know, you guys are going to, over the next week or so, I know, I think you guys have committed, what, about three to four hours? Um, and you are welcome to do more if you'd like. But like I said, we're going to assign you a certain number of counties depend, based on how many of you, um, I think we have about eight people on the call. I think we have about three or four more who are going to watch the video. So we will divvy up the counties. 
um, and we will again give you the survey. We'll have a spreadsheet that you guys can use to enter the information that we'll send to you via email. And you'll contact the court and you'll find out is there a formal committee? Is there a formal school justice partnership? Who's the contact? Um, and if the county does, has both a school justice, um, a school uh, attendance committee and a school climate committee, do they operate together or do they work separately? Um, because some counties have in Fulton, we, we combined the two uh, after a while um, because it just made more sense because most of the same people were serving on the committees. But there are going to be, we anticipate some communities that um, keep the committee separate and, and have separate meetings. And so that's something that's, that's of interest to us as well to kind of figure out um, how they are operating. And then, you know, at, when we follow up with the counties, we will delve a little deeper into, you know, what kind of um, policies have come out of, of the committee work, what kind of, but we really just want, what you guys are going to be helping us with is really getting this kind of big picture of what, what the state of the committees actually is across the state and out of the 159 counties do we have 10 counties who have committees or do we have 100 counties who have committees that are that are fully implemented and operating so there is uh, going to be a link to your superior courts um, we really tried our very very best to create a list um, of contacts for you guys but that is just really impossible to do <laughs> can i can i can i say something about that karen so sure just, when I say we worked really hard, I mean, not. It's not. this is a particular challenge in Georgia, and this is why a project like this is actually really important. And Georgia Appleseed over the years has done a, 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 lar a, a number of these very large, this is kind of a smaller effort, but very large interviewing and surveying projects across, around the state around justice issues. Um, and one of the challenges in Georgia is that it's highly decentralized court system. You know, 159 counties, like Karen said, not that many judicial districts, but um, and, and there's not a lot of communication. So Karen was working with the head of the Clerks Association for Georgia. There's, mm -hmm. This list does not, does not exist. Um, <laughs> and so you know, part of the work here is making these phone calls and recording what happens. Because it may be that you say, no one will get back to me. You know, I tried mm -hmm. three or four times to connect with someone or the person that did simply refused to talk to me. That is really important for us to know. Um, so this is a project where it isn't just, it, gosh, I couldn't find out this one fact. It's actually the circumstances itself will tell us a lot because we'll be able to say only 10 or five, or as I suspect four <laughs> or five <laughs> counties confirm that they have this kind of thing, this committee actively meeting, right? Uh -huh. 25 counties simply refuse to address the issue or had no idea what we were talking about, right? That, that's actually really critical information um, because it goes into how we approach policy and how we'll talk to policymakers and how we'll do outreach to the different um, to the different counties. Right. So it's going to be, you know, each of you, again, with your specific counties, whether you may have 10 counties or 15 counties, um, we'll just go to this link that we'll provide. Does all the superior courts are, um, oh, we keep losing him. Okay. All the superior courts are going to be right there. Um, on the website, and you'll have the contact information for um, the respective uh, judge for your for the county um, or the judicial circuit that that is assigned to you. That's on your list, and you should be able to make your calls within your you know. You, with it. We're hoping that you'll make calls. Emails may not work as well. Just depends, or you could do both, whatever whichever way you find it easier. Um, but um, you know, we're thinking that you should be able to achieve this within your three to four hours if you. Um, don't get through your entire list. Just let us know. Just you know, you can just kind of indicate that you know, with with the time that that you had, you were only able to get to five or to ten. Um, if you want to donate a few, a, a little more time to to get through all of them, that is absolutely fine. Um, you know, I know you guys. I think set the parameters of one week, but if you know, we are happy and 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 probably. I, honestly, I think you probably want to give yourselves two weeks if you can, because we're all working and we've got a lot going on. Um, and so we are happy to kind of extend this out a little bit um, just so that you don't feel rushed and, and, and um, feel like you're on a time crunch. Um, and, and then, we'll, you know, we will, we will, we have um, a, another a partner law firm that is going to help us kind of tabulate the information received. Um, and then we will get back to you with kind of a, hey, this is 
this is what we were able to find out from the wonderful research that you guys were able to do. This is our starting point, and this is where we're thinking we're going to go with this. Um, and um, so, so what we want you to know is that the work that you that you are going to do for us over the next couple of weeks is really going to set the the foundation and the groundwork for um, what we believe is can, is really going to be a big project and a big initiative for us. Um, over the next couple of months or maybe even the next couple of years is really um, trying to get our, our communities focused on um, implementing and achieving the goals, implementing school climate and school attendance committees with fidelity and achieving the goals that, that we, that the legislature initially set out when, um, when they, you know, uh, passed this legislation and we will see as a result a dramatic um, improvement in school climate across the state because the communities will really be working together to make sure that we are improving the way that we are um, handling um, student discipline, school climate um, across the board. So it's a big movement and you guys are going are, are an extremely vital piece of that because you again are the foundation and this work is going to lay the foundation for the work that we're going to be able to do. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. And I, you know, so just to kind of reiterate, so this is a GAPABA initially led project and we've been working on this for a long time together to, to sort of get this finally going, but you are not alone. Uh, there will be other, other volunteers that, that help us with this work. Um, this is something that we periodically do with courts. So three times over the pandemic, we've surveyed all the magistrate courts in the state around their eviction um, policies, how they're approaching that. And we've worked with Georgia State University to publish, analyze and publish those results over the, after the, each survey. So um, you can go to our website and our Healthy Housing uh, page and you can see links to some of those results. And those were pretty amazing. Um, told us what was actually happening. There was no other way to know than to actually reach out and talk to the courts individually. There was no other, there's no body in Georgia that collects that information or reports it out. Um, this is how it's done. So um, there's a long history of us doing this sort of thing. It's um, one of the few ways that Georgians can know what's going on with their court system. So it's really critical and important. It is a little messy because of that decentralization. And so that's why we really rely on uh, volunteers like y'all to help us. The other big issue I wanna reiterate that Karen pointed out is this is about government accountability at its most basic fundamental level. Um, laws are passed, people get credit for those laws. They're saying they're doing the good work. And then somebody's go, gotta, gotta go back behind and say, is it really happening? Is it really happening? Is it really making a difference? Um, I don't think that school attendance and school climate committees have been a major driver yet in the reforms that we've seen outside a few counties. Um, where they have been implemented in Clayton County and Fulton County um, and a few other places, they've made a big difference. Um, but you know, there's a lot, as Karen pointed out, there's a lot of room here, there's low hanging fruit. If we can get these counties to engage with their police, engage with their schools, mm -hmm. engage the courts together to talk about solutions. And Karen led, um, really organized and led the Pathways Committee, which is the, the version of this in Fulton County and kept it going for a few years. Um, it's very vibrant and active and it's amazing. We could talk for hours mm -hmm. about the stories about how these different groups work together to change their behavior towards kids and the positive impact it had on school, mm -hmm. um, on outcomes mm -hmm. for these kids. So. Um, Let's see, I'll move on to the, the question and answers. We've got a few minutes. I just want to say yeah. one little thing, Michael. A great yeah. example of how I talked earlier about the, how both at the Atlanta Public Schools and Fulton County Schools have police departments now that actually are, are their full-fledged police department. Well, as a result of this emphasis on school climate, um, both of the captains um, for Fulton County Schools Police Department and Atlanta Public Schools Departments um, are a part of our school justice partnership, our school pathways committee, as we call it. And they now are training their officers in trauma. They're training their officers in um, more social work measures, more counseling measures. And so they don't get involved in, in typical team, uh, uh, school behavior incidents. They only get involved in matters if there seems to be a criminal element to it. And so that's just an example of how these committees can work. We now have officers walking through um, our schools who are not looking um, at our kids from this strictly law enforcement lens. They really are looking at our kids from 
a, a lens of care, concern. We're trying to keep you in school, keep you engaged, and they are taking on more of a, of a counselor um, role in a sense and, and really trying to work with the schools to keep the kids engaged. So it's a beautiful thing to see when it happens. And so that is what your work is, is going to be doing, is helping us to get to that point in every school across the state. And I'll also That's add that you know, one of the, <laughs> the big achievements of these committees, because, you know, wherever your position is on, on police and schools, and, and there's a, you know, a lot of folks, you're going to say there's just no business at all for police to be in schools at all, at all. But police are in schools. Um, and so we have to be pragmatic about what it means and how they behave in schools, as Karen's pointing out. Mm -hmm. And one of the great achievements of these school climate committees is at the very beginning of some of them, they set out to develop an MOU that limits the officers' interactions with kids around discipline issues. And simply says, what is your role? And that's protective of the students, but it also protects the police officers. Um, schools will use, you just kind of, the person's there, you're going to use them. They end up using officers as a resource to control student behavior in ways that they should not. Um, and it exposes the kids to the police and exposes them to greater criminal, greater criminal justice involvement risk. So um, these, these things matter. And hopefully we'll all get to a place where like, hey, we can make schools safe without having police officers run around, roam around. Okay. Schools. So um, we've got a few minutes left uh, for questions. And I'll make sure I also put um, our contact information here. Of course, you can reach out to us with any questions. Karen is our director and legal and policy director. So she actually runs all of our programming. I'm just talking because she's actually still pretty new. So she's only been with us for five weeks. She, she's been working with us for years on a variety of projects. Um, so, so I will, unfortunately, these are fun for me and I'll probably have less and less of these as we go for, uh, Morgan Bridgman is our new policy counsel. She's been with us for a few weeks and she and Karen are running this project and all of our others too. So reach out to them with any questions and you can reach me at M Waller at G A Appleseed. So Michael Waller, M Waller, M W A L L E R. So again, you know, what we'll do, um, we will take the list of attendees. We will send you guys an email with the script, the link to the survey, and the link to the Superior Court uh, website uh, on Monday uh, with your assigned counties. And uh, it may be later in the day because we just have to have time based on um, the attendees to kind of split the list up and that kind of thing. Um, and then, like I said, we'll give, we're, we're going to give you guys two weeks. If you get it done in one week, that's totally fine. But we're, we're going to give you two weeks. And if you, even if you need more than that, uh, then that's totally fine, too. Um, and, but in the, you know, in the, as you're calling, as, you, as you're making the inquiries, as you have questions, I'm sorry, my son decided to get some ice right as <laughs> I'm trying to wrap this up. Um, Anderson, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, so we, you know, and then we will, um, we'll get that out to you and you guys will, will have time to, to, but call, email with any questions that come up, any concerns that come up as you're making the calls and the inquiries, and we will be absolutely happy um, to, to assist and give advice as, as needed. So and just know how appreciative we are. We are so grateful that you guys have taken this project on. Um, and we're just looking forward to the information that we get um, as a result. Well, I just want to thank you, Karen and Michael. This was a great presentation introduction. And thank you to uh, Sid and Maria for the PABA and Hispanic Boards. Um, this is just such an important project. So thank you all for, for helping us and um, guiding us through this project. And we're glad to help. Absolutely. And for those of you who are seeking CLE credit, um, we are, it, the, the approval is still pending. We don't anticipate that there will be any issues with it, but I know you guys have, I think, uh, already submitted your bar numbers to Carol, but if you, if you haven't, let me go ahead and, and send them to her, or when I send out the information, you can send them to me, because I'll be the one submitting um, um, everyone's information for the credit. Um, but as soon as we get approval for that, we will let you know. And, and then, you know, the bar, you know, the, the credit will show up on your, you know, bar statement and then you can, you'll handle the payment. I think it's $4 or something like that. You can handle it from there. So, well, we're excited. It's 12 on the dot. We're going to let everybody go and enjoy this fabulous Saturday. If you're here in Atlanta, if you're not, um, you're in California. I uh, hope it's, it's beautiful like this every day out there. So, um, um, Sid, we know you're going to have a great day no matter which day it is. So, um, thanks everybody, and we will be in touch. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. <laughs>